Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast, a series for recruiters by recruiters. I'm Danny Reinert, and in each episode, I have candid conversations about careers in recruitment with some of the best talent that Team Eames has to offer. They'll be giving you a glimpse into the highs and lows of their recruitment careers, their motivations and drivers, and their secret to success in the industry. You can listen and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and other favorite podcast platforms. Let's meet our next guest. Good afternoon, James. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? Yeah, very well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us for another session of Secrets of Success. No worries. I did a little bit of convincing to get you on, didn't I? So uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, and we got a couple of... And wanted, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was begging. I was begging by the end. Let's be honest. So um, look, thank you for taking the time to join us. There's a couple of key topics that we're going to cover today, um, notably uh, hiring and developing juniors and also operating it in the niche market that you do. But yep. before we kind of get into the really meaty stuff, could you give me a quick overview for people people that don't know you of the market that you operate in and, and your role at Eames and, and your team? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm a partner and director at Eames. I lead our uh, actuarial and um, insurance risk um, function, which um, predominantly focus on uh, catastrophe modelling and exposure management, uh, and then actuarial predominantly focus on the, the non-life general insurance market. Fab. So I think we'd agree for people that aren't familiar with those markets, highly technical, specialised niche markets, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, highly intelligent individuals, uh, you know, their role in life is to uh, ascertain risk and um, obviously look at sort of statistical analysis and all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, very, very techie people, but um, yeah. a joy to work with. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So I mentioned just now one of the key topics to talk about today is the um, hiring, onboarding and development of entry level recruiters. So lots of people have different terminology for it. We call them associate consultants, that entry level role or, or ACs. Yeah. And um, I know you're a very modest individual, but I think you'd agree you have had an overwhelming amount of success in bringing those people in at that level and bringing them up through the ranks, consultant, senior consultant, principal, senior principal and turning, you know, juniors into some of the top billing consultants that we've got in the UK business at the moment. So that's to kind of set the scene for people listening and watching this who aren't familiar with you. Um, and today, I just want to get an understanding of how you go about doing that, essentially. So if we start with the interview process to, uh, yep. initially, when you're interviewing ACs, what generally is your approach to interviewing a, an AC at entry level? Um. I mean, I think for me, I, I keep things relatively informal at first stage. I mean, you know, the fundamental points are that um, anyone interviewing for any recruitment role at entry level, um, they don't know what the job is, um, and I, I wouldn't expect them to know. Um, they certainly shouldn't be um, giving me answers to say over the last 10 years, all they've thought about is being, a, a, you know, a recruitment consultant or that's mm -hmm. their job or anything like that. I think for me, you know, it's just about understanding the sort of key um, attributes of an individual. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, as I said in an interview yesterday, what what, what I, I'm guiding a little bit more by is is the sense of what preparation they've done ahead of the interview, what questions they ask me, uh, and what they're interested to find out about the role. Um, you know, people that ask me, the first question they ask is, um, you know, can I work from home? They're not going to be right for the role. Um, mm -hmm. People that ask. Um, you know really in the next five years where can I get to or what sort of progression can I see if I get my head down and I work really really hard those are the sort of questions you're, you're interested in and and I suppose some of the best answers have been around you know I think I'm a you know I can handle certain resilience but and I, I like to rise to the challenge what sort of things do you think that that would you know what sort of what things would I have to overcome on a daily basis to, to make me successful and um, it's the more insightful questions that you get are the ones that you you possibly think that people are um thinking about things a little bit more because mm. you know ultimately everyone ends up in recruitment um not because they've chosen to go into recruitment just because mm. that's how they've fallen into it yeah but and that but that doesn't necessarily mean in an interview process that you should operate in that way to say well mm. i've fallen into it and therefore i'm just giving it a go the idea would be for any interview bit if it's for actuarial or, or recruitment you've got to prepare properly and actually take it seriously to understand the opportunity that's in front of you and i think there's a very clear difference between people that turn up to an interview thinking well I didn't really recognize that recruitment was a role and therefore I'm just chancing it and then people actually mm. go 
even if that was the situation, I'm going to give my all and really prepare because I can see that there's something in this moving forwards. Yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. So two of the main things there around the preparation and the questions. And it, would I be right in thinking the questions and sort of summarise what you said there, they, they kind of the questions that an AC or a candidate at interview asks you, that's when you get that real insight into how their brain works and, and kind of them putting the pieces together and being inquisitive, which are all the things you need to be to be a good recruiter, right? You're going to ask a lot of questions, you're going to probe candidates, you're going to gather information and put the pieces together as part of your role so I suppose yeah. we're seeing that as a skill through the interview process even as well as much as them sort of thinking it through as well yeah I mean I think look I think the um I think recruitment is a, is a lifestyle it's not it's not just a job I mean if anyone thinks that they're going to come in and, and switch on at nine o'clock and, and leave at five yeah. and, they come and not think about it, it it's it's wrong because yeah. ultimately you have to operate in the times when your candidates and clients aren't operating because they have a day job to do at, at the same mm. time so I think in general, um, you know, the way you approach these situations and, and the questions you ask are really defined by, you know, whether you are taking it to mean that this is something you have to go all in on or whether you actually just see it as a nine to five, which um, there are lots of nine to five jobs out there and recruitment is yep. one, one of them. And I'm sure there are much more um, easier roles to do if you if mm. that's what you're interested in. And, and I said, you do get a sense as to people's motivations and obviously everyone gets prepped to a recruitment interview to say the same stuff which is you know money motivated and you know work hard and all the rest of it yeah actually um by the questions and the answers and you know the preparation that people put in you do get a sense actually whether they mean that or whether they're just saying yeah it. yeah absolutely so your advice i suppose if you're thinking about advice for other directors and managers hiring acs it's it's kind of getting past the the buzzwords, isn't it? Of I'm resilient, I'm hardworking, and actually probing for the examples and the evidence to support that. Because if you know whether it's through a TA team or a rectorec, you know there is that level of prep that's given to ACs. I mean, and they have to Google online, you know, typical interview questions for a recruitment role. Um, so it's getting beyond those buzzwords, isn't it? And actually looking for the evidence to to demonstrate those skills. Yeah, I think I think it's everything that you've actually gone away and thought about the interview itself. And, and sometimes mm. that can be challenging because you may be interviewing for multiple companies and multiple roles. But um, particularly, a, you know, a, an entry level, if you're coming from a bit of graduate background or, or something else, you, you you know, realistically, you should have the time to invest in, in your career at that stage. And yeah. I said, even before the interview, I'll get a good sense of someone by, um, you know, recently I had a, 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 an associate that I was interviewing that, you know, they'd looked my um, my profile up at least four times ahead of the interview. And the first time was probably about two weeks ahead of the interview. So at least from my point of view, even though I yeah. know I'm interviewing for two weeks, I know they're already starting to think about the interview, which is, which yeah. is a great way to approach it. Yeah, nice. Love that. Absolutely. Um, good stuff. So now we think about kind of the onboarding of, of ACs. And that's, you know, obviously we have an AC program at EAMS that supports you with that. And that, you know, the, the L&D function that supports with that with some of the training. So if we think beyond the kind of standard training and everything that, that we would support you with in L&D, how do you make sure you set ACs up for success when they land onto that desk in the first kind of four weeks? I think the um I think for us, you know, the the, the platform Eames is very, very strong for for or particularly within within my world, um, very strong for associates to plug in because we have a very collaborative team that like to work together and and, and that provides support. Um, I think in the way that I, I like to set ACs up is is really to to give them um a, a bit of independence to start off with. And I think um, you know, the, Within within the work that we do, you know, it's very flexible to say that I, I would expect anyone to, you know, if there's a phone call that needs to be made at nine p.m. at night, then then that's what it has to do because yeah. ultimately it's money in the long run, um, and therefore you can't have the the sort of strict structure to say that this is this is your your job between these hours and these hours. You, you need people to actually understand what it is to be an independent person within their within their career, mm -hmm. and as um, that has to start from day one. You can't you can't have it whereby you give loads of flexibility to you know directors and people that have been doing twenty years, but you 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 have associates working in a very restrictive way. So mm. I think for me, I, I I set out principles and 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 sort of views as to um, how things should be run. But then I like people to you know bring in their individual style and their you know yeah. their their independence. And as I said, sometimes that that works out um, really well and people absolutely fly with that sometimes mm. I think people 
um, aren't used to that because they've maybe had a structure whereby, you know, university you go to certain lectures at certain times or they've yeah. worked that is, I don't know, working in retail where they clock in and clock out. And so I think that that's the bit that you need to help in terms of challenge. You either need to, you know, if people are really adaptable to that that way of working, then you, you know, you build onto it. If people mm. aren't necessarily that um that way inclined, then you have to help support them to actually understand, you know, what it means to manage your own day, to to set out your business yeah. plans, you know, to really um think about when you need to do what activities and for how long and how much and, and all the mm. rest. And then once you've kind of got those principles, the rest of it is just um volume input you know so once you've got kind of a where well oiled machine in terms of how you you like to operate and what works for you um then ultimately it's just about activity within that and yeah and, you know, to an extent you can you can sort of teach that but that is an mm. great drive within an individual which you'd hope you'd identify in in the in the interview process itself so yeah, yeah i said I, I think the first point is is finding out how they how they work and 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 i suppose um building onto that and mm. I said, everyone is different I, I work in a very different you know I, I work quite visually and I like lots of data there are people mm. that need things in different colors and all sorts of ways yeah. and say this is what you use and this is how you do it it's for me to add the general principles and and how we work as a team and the, the collaboration mm. and the, the, the sort of minimums and then to sort of you know embrace how they like to work and and, and build that in yeah, absolutely. Um, fantastic advice. And I agree wholeheartedly. One of the things that you mentioned there in particular is about people being independent. We talked about this before. Do you feel that it's something that's become even more important since, and I'm going to mention the C word, COVID, um, since COVID and the flexible working and like we're back working 100% from home at the moment, the majority of us at Eames in the lead up to Christmas. Um, and we need to be able to trust people to work independently and work under their own steam and their own drive. So do you think all of that has become even more important due to COVID? And it's something you prioritise even more when you're interviewing, onboarding, kind of setting those expectations as a director? I wouldn't say it's more important um, because I think it's always been that way, but mm -hmm. I would say it's more relevant now. Um, OK, yeah. You know, I, I think um, I think the major thing that COVID's brought up is self-motivation. I think. Mm. Being able to operate independently and being able to manage your own desk and all the rest of it, you know that that comes with a, a process and a, and, a, and a style. But then I suppose the innate, you know, the the activity levels um, and the the sort of uh, the drive of an individual and the motivation that's the bit that gets tested. And I suppose yeah. you know, the difficulty for us is um, is around supporting that because ultimately, um, you know, working from home isn't for everyone. Um, no being sat in whatever circumstances they have you know in their in their home life doesn't necessarily match to a really productive day at work for some people it will do for some it won't and, and again it's just about adapting your style to see who works um well in 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 what environment and i suppose yeah. you know, I, i'm a big believer in the in the flexible model i think it's great to to sort of you know have the time when you're in the office as a team and you can build that culture and then i think it's mm. also people have that flexibility to work from home and you know, to, to an extent, we've kind of always had that aims whereby, you know, there is the flexibility because you might yeah. go out half a day or a day doing various meetings and be out yeah. in the city and no matter what. So there's always been that that flexibility. But I guess it's, it, you know, the challenge now is to make sure that people have the uh, the support they need to, to stay motivated and to make sure when that, you know, the hard knocks of recruitment um, that, that inevitably come on a, on a daily basis, don't take it out of you, whereby you, you know, you're sat in your lounge watching TV instead of back in yeah, your house. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Fabulous. So the um, the other thing we mentioned about your market in particular, and it's not just actuarial and, and, and cat risk and stuff that are like this, but you extremely niche market, highly technical, very the most candidate driven market I've ever been aware of in my 13 years in recruitment, where yep. you've always got loads of jobs on, but it's going out there and finding the candidates that can that can be a struggle. So that's something that I'm keen to sort of learn a little bit more from you uh, now, because other people will operate in similar markets. How do you as a director and a manager of juniors, because the experienced guys are very familiar with it, you know, Raf and Curtis and your team, they've done secrets of success sessions with me already and talked about their journey with it and their frustrations. But how do you as a manager of that team keep ACs motivated when all the jobs are there? I mean, I think you guys in COVID at one point had like 90 jobs between six of you, like so many jobs on. And it's trying to find the candidates, which is ultimately at the beginning, the main part of an AC's role. 
So when they're really struggling to find the cats or even find people to speak to and everything, how do you keep them focused and motivated as their director? I mean, I think I think the um, I think the difficulty thing with with a candidate led market is that sometimes the 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 important thing about that is the marginal gains that you have from each interaction you have with a candidate, and sometimes, um, particularly as an AC, um, those marginal gains are, are so small that you might not actually see what the benefit is to those. So mm. I think it's teaching individuals what the you know what the benefit is of having a chat to them about I don't know what they did at the weekend or yeah. You know, interest are and, and making a note of that so the next time you call them you ask them how you know, late and orient got over the weekend or whatever it might be and and I think that's possibly the bit that's a bit more difficult to teach because um, unless you've done a role whereby you understand about sort of research and you know um, you know you know development of relationships all that sort of things it is all it is all completely new and mm. um, I think what runs alongside that is that for, for an associate that does find a good candidate and brings them to the table and, and ultimately that that person wants to engage with them and, and look for work within the actual market, you can almost guarantee that, you know, that's, that person is going to get a job because there's so yeah. much. So, you know, in, in a sense, they can almost, once they've got that person, the, the sort of that feeling of doing a deal is almost there. Not, not you know, a deal's not done until it's done, but, you know. Yeah, I know what you mean extent but it's, it's the process of getting to that and I think you know lots of the consultants we work with now obviously talk about you know sort of Raf and Curtis I think you know Raf just done a deal with a candidate she's been speaking to for about two and a half years and so yes she's obviously delighted with the deal if actually if I said to an associate well if you keep on with this candidate in two and a half years time you'll make <laughs> probably leave straight away but um but I said it's having that sort of pipeline I think um yeah I said I think the important thing is that for every interaction you have with a candidate you'll get something out of it and, mm. and they may not understand what that is at the time but I think it's that sort of regular check-in process whereby you you know test them on their market knowledge or you yeah. you get a sense as to what you know what the difference are between certain candidates or you ask them you know what, what's a good candidate versus a good candidate give me some examples and mm. very quickly they'll be able to give you answers that they probably don't even notice that they'll be able to give you answers on yeah because when you're just working day to day, you possibly don't understand that every conversation you have with a candidate, your brain is automatically understanding a little bit more about the actual market or a little bit more about, you know, um, different personalities or, or the mm. difference between different candidates. And I think um, that's possibly where they they can see some progression. But um, we have been quite lucky in the actual market that our associates do make deals relatively quickly and therefore they have to have these awkward conversations. But um, that's it. A any, any recruiter starting out um you know the important thing is to learn and develop and you know i've always said that the associate consultant um framework is, is a sort of training contract it's there to really you know invest that time into your career and mm. spend it doing as much research as much sort of um as much uh conversations with candidates really putting in the time into actually um in, you know working out what's a good call what's a bad call mm. how you can approach things slightly differently um because once you become a consultant and then you go up the ranks you don't ever have that time again to invest um into your your development you, you know you always do bits on the side but at the end of the day you always have targets and um other things over your head that that, that need attention so it, it, it's really important that that's a process that they invest in and i think mm. it, that hopefully should be motivation enough running alongside obviously the the, the, the financial gains but i think yeah. i think it, i said it, it is that that process why we have to have people understand why they're doing things as opposed to the fact that they're just doing activity over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. There is some cracking advice in there for ACs. It's making me reflect. I wish I'd known all that now when I was an AC. But the, the couple of the things in there in particular, the main thing I've taken out of that, and I think, you know, ACs and directors alike think it, watching and listening to this, is that marginal gains piece. I think that's just such a powerful phrase because, you know, we use, you know, activity measures, KPIs, whatever you want to call them. They're fairly very achievable on a week by week basis, you know, CV sends and interviews and things that you would expect ACs to want to achieve and milestones but I suppose if you're operating in a really candidate driven market and, and candidate short market then actually celebrating the even smaller wins along the way and those marginal gains of I got someone to talk to me for 15 minutes that I've been trying to get hold a hold of for for two months and they've not given me the time of day and now they have like you say that's kind of a win in itself and it, it's making people aware of that so I think that's great advice million percent all, all relationships at the start start from nothing you know you know if mm. you to a 
um, I don't know, you speak to a, a client and they have absolutely no interest in working with you, um, you know, a, a bad recruiter says, oh, they're not going to give me any time. The, a good recruiter will say, well, look, they've said no, that's starting point. Next bit is maybe they say, no, thank you. And then the next bit is, yeah, no, thank you, but give me a call in a couple of months, you know, and then it, yeah. you, from there. But as I said, it's, um, it's all well and good candidates coming into interviews and saying, like, I'm really resilient and I can take the knocks. But actually, when it happens, um, it, it's, it, it's a different thing. And whether the people that can actually learn from that um, uh, and, and apply it to the next call are the ones that, that generally work out. Um, mm-hmm. And the people that actually just say, oh, that door's closed and move on. And yeah. the that it never really works out for. Absolutely. Fantastic. James, look, loads of stuff for people to listen to and take away and digest there and and hopefully put into practice. So thank you very much for taking the time out for another session of Secrets of Success. That's all right. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.